Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,627. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah! I'm revved up and very excited to share with you today a guest calling in from, well, he's practically my neighbor, Fox Island, Washington, which is right here, right next to Gig Harbor, Washington, by the name of Craig McLaughlin. Hey, Craig, welcome to Cars Yeah! Are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I am ready for the ride of my life. All right. We'll have some fun. That's a nice uh, setting of the tone. I want to reach out first and say thank you to Michael Branning. He's a listener here. He's introduced me to a lot of interesting people. He's the one that suggested I should contact Craig. And uh, when I did, I found out that he's living right nearby. So I think I'm going to go jump in my Porsche and visit his uh, incredible collection of cars, which you're going to hear about. Before I introduce you properly, though, would you share one little thing with my listeners that maybe most people don't know about you. Things that people, you know, my life is an open book. I usually, I have a lot of weaknesses and failings. And it, unfortunately, we'll everybody that. that knows me <laughs> know that knows those as well. That I, I can say I, I probably, there's two incidents in my life where I was actually investigated for things by proper authorities. And some of my closest friends know those. It was all turned out to be much ado about nothing, but I did uh, was investigated by the California State Board of Accountancy and by the bank and the federal government, actually. Oh, wow. Yep. That must have yes. been a little bit unnerving. It was. The State Board of Accountancy, that, that arose from, uh, I took the CPA exam in May of 74, and a gentleman who I barely knew copied off my paper. And the question oh. was, did I did that happen knowingly or not? Ended up with a lie detector test proving my innocence. Really? Um, wow. Yes. Uh, that was that was interesting. I, I asked the police officer at the end. I said, "How'd I do?" And I loved his answer. He said, "You should already know." And I said, "Well, then I'm good." <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, that's it. That's a classic answer. I like that. Very, very cool. Yeah. And then the the bank I was with for 50 years. I got my first account with them. I won't name the bank, but my first account with them uh, when I was a young teenager. And all of a sudden, I got in, you know, later on, in the, I, I got into the real estate business and managed apartments. Mm-hmm. And I got a call from the bank, and they were worried about my cash deposits that reoccurred always around the first of the month. And I said, well, it's an apartment. You know, that's it. And she goes, well, you can't do that. You've got to tell people to write a check. And I said, well, I can't force people to write a check. Right. Long story short, three months later, they said we can no, they sent me a letter saying we can no longer do business with you because of this. And I called up the bank and they said our compliance department has total control. There's nothing we can do about it. And I uh, called uh, the president's office and I said, I understand, you know, the laws you're operating under and all the rest of it. I have a question for you. I said, did you report this whole matter to the federal government? And he says, I can't tell you that. And <laughs> the law says if they report us, they can't say anything. But if they don't report, they can say no. So he already answered my question. And two months later, I got audited by the Internal Revenue Service, which turned out really well. I got a $4,000 refund. (laughs) So that was all good. I wrote the bank a letter saying, thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah. I I worked and lived in California most of my life. And as it turns out, listeners, Craig and I graduated from the same college, which is another strange coincidence. Here we find ourselves uh, in the Northwest with some cool cars. Uh, But yeah, we, um, the business I was with, we got audited by the California State Franchise Tax Board. Lovely people. Oh, God. Oh, oh, oh. I don't even want to. Talk. Yeah. So he parked himself in, his, in our office, had to have his own private little room and everything. So I gave up my office and I walked in there day three and I said, I have a question for you. Part of this you're looking into is this statute. And I read it off and I said, the way I understand this is this. And he said, you're absolutely right. Well, it turns out that we had been wrongfully collecting sales tax, thinking we should from our, our uh, clients. And so mm-hmm. it turns out they had to write us a big fat check, and then we got to write all of our clients nice checks to give them all their money back. And nice. so that didn't go too well for him. He, he had kind of a sour look on his face when I presented <laughs> him all that. I said, well, it looks like uh, you owe us some money. <laughs> so uh, that was a nice— I, lo- I love it when the, when the little guy wins. 
Well, yeah, because we don't win too often when it comes to these big entities. Well, let me give you a proper introduction here. Craig McLaughlin is an avid automotive enthusiast and uh, with a very unique collection of 50s era sports and touring cars. His career covered a practice as an attorney, uh, emphasis on taxes and business matters like we were talking about, and he is owned and owns and manages rental property as well. Today, along with his real estate focus, Craig focuses a lot of his time and finds time to drive one of his many, I think you have nine cars now? Now, is that right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, and these things range from 1952 Singer 4AD, a Lancia Aurelia B52 Ghia B Jr. to a 1957 Mercedes-Benz 300 SO Roadster and a 59 Daimler SP250. You've got very eclectic taste. Craig, we'll be back in a minute to talk more about you and your cars. But first, a word from our valued sponsors. Hey, give these uh, folks a little love, a little attention, because they're the reason we're here on Cars Yeah. Keep your seatbelts on. We're going to have a fun ride. We'll be right back. Did you know the most damaging thing to your vehicle's interior is the sun? Those harsh UV rays damage your interior over time. They crack your dash, they fade the colors, and the heat makes getting into your favorite ride downright unbearable. My friends at Covercraft have the perfect solution for you. Their sunscreens are easy to use. They take seconds to install and remove and protect your vehicle while parked in the sun. They fold up easily and store away for those times you don't want to use your car cover. I have one for every one of my vehicles, and you should too. They come in a variety of colors and options, featuring an accordion design that makes unfolding and folding them a breeze. Want to give a gift that keeps on giving? Buy a Covercraft sunscreen for your family members and friends. They'll thank you for it every time they park their vehicle. They're custom made to fit almost any vehicle. Check out Covercraft.com for a huge number of styles, colors, and options. And here's something special from me here at Cars yeah, just for you. Use the code ya 120 at checkout at Covercraft.com and you'll get 10% off your Covercraft order. Go to Covercraft.com and use the code yeah 120 at checkout, and you get 10% off. You can thank me later. Covercraft, they've got you covered. I found a new way to protect my vehicle. American Collectors Insurance. That's who now protects my Porsche Turbo, the one I call my orange crush. But did you know they also insure your valuable collectibles of automobilia and automotive collectibles? If you're like me, you've invested in a lot of cool automotive collectibles over the years. Those items are valuable. And if you were to lose them in a theft or a fire, well, try to get your normal homeowner's insurance to pay you what they're worth. Good luck with that. American Collectors Insurance provides you with assurance and confidence that your collectibles are fully covered. American Collectors Insurance have been protecting us automotive enthusiasts since 1976. They provided me with an agreed value insurance policy backed by a history of taking care of their clients. Give them a call today for a quote at 866-ACI. Yeah, that's 866-224-9324. And protect the ones you love. I did. American Collectors Insurance, classic car and collectible insurance designed by collectors for collectors, just like you and me. All right, Craig, we are back. And as we continue on this journey of cars in your life, I would love for you to share with my listeners maybe a little success quote or a mantra, some kind of saying that has meaning for you. It's a nice way to get the tires spinning a little bit here on Cars Yeah. So I know you love to drive. Grab the wheel. Well, I would think that probably my guiding mantra came from my father. It wasn't a quote or a phrase, but it was what he taught me. Uh, and I've followed this religiously throughout my life. My dad taught me two things. One is to be honest without effort. And the other one was to be ethical without thought. And I try to practice both of those principles in everything I do. You know, my dad was very much the same way. And he said to me once, I remember when I was young, he said, you know, if you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you said. Exactly right. <laughs> so it's kind of like that story with the lie detector test. You already knew how you did, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. At least exactly. you hope the machine yeah. works right. So, Well, that's it. You never know what the needles are doing, you know. <laughs> well, I know. Yeah, maybe you're just nervous yeah. or whatever. Well, let me yeah. ask you this. I mean, you had a career not in the automotive sector, but in finance and taxes and law, managing apartments, dealing with <laughs> tenants. That's a whole different uh, yeah. life lesson, of course, On uh, and being honest and ethical with them. Is there a, a way you could describe how you've incorporated that into your life and your career and why it was so important? Basically, like I said, whenever 
I'll couple that with another quote. When I was practicing law, one of my clients was a very large auto dealer in Los Angeles, very successful guy, one of the nation's biggest car dealers, Mm -hmm. and did a lot of legal work for him. And we were driving around one day, and he told me, he says, you know, my philosophy is I always want to make sure that everything I do is a win-win for both parties. And I put that together with what my dad taught me, and it became very easy because if it's a win-win for both, you're probably being honest and you're being ethical to begin with. So those two things, I always tried to tell people exactly when I was practicing law. You know, I gave them a good estimate on what what the job I could do for them, what it was going to cost, the time frame I could do it. Uh, when I was dealing with clients, I always gave them legal advice based on practicality and my honest belief of you know what was right for them and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. So everything I did, and that carries over to the apartments, uh, same thing. We treat our residents very well. We treat our employees very well yeah. because that all comes back to you as evidence of that with the COVID and everything that's going on and some apartment people have collection issues and that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. We've had none of that. Uh, we've managed to pay our employees every dime they've earned throughout this process. And we've only had, I think, one person skip. The rest of the people have been you know, paying as, as obligated without complaint. It wow. comes back at you. Well, of course, of course. And we have, you know, with what's going on, and of course, when you talk about expensive areas to live in, like Southern California, I know you did business down there. A lot of people just simply can't afford to buy property down there and they have to rent and they have to live in uh, a rental and that's just the way it is. So, But the ethics part of it, I wanted to ask you this because you and I are more mature guys. I won't say we're old. I'll just say we're more mature. Uh, and, True uh, Yeah. Have you seen, and it seems to me, and maybe I need to just stay off social media, a, a, a kind of a serious decline in, in morals and ethics in this country and honesty. It's almost as if sometimes it's okay to not be honest. It's okay not to be ethical. Has that been your experience with the people you're dealing with? Or uh, can you can you kind of set me straight and say, Mark, you've just been looking in the wrong places? No, unfortunately, I think I would have to agree with you. I think honesty and ethics have taken a real hit, mm-hmm. uh, just the way civil society has taken a hit lately. Yes. It's very disappointing to see, you know, this integration that's happening before our eyes. And, uh, you know, when you see a lot of the people on TV, both in politics and in the news and that kind of thing, are telling stories from a very slanted viewpoint. Yes. It makes it hard to get the truth. You have to look at different sources and multiple sources. I think it, that kind of wears at the fabric of our society, and it's a major concern for me. Major concern. Yeah, it is for me, too. And I, I guess, as I remember my dad used to tell me, is you've got to lead by example. And just no matter what, continue to be honest, continue to be ethical, forthright, tell yep. the truth. And uh, yep. hopefully people will see that and realize that, that you can be successful. You don't have to be dishonest and so forth. I want to ask you a couple of questions about your car collection, because this is about cars. Sure. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to buying a collector car, what are some of the key focal points that you bring together in that buying decision when you decide to buy it. And I'll let our listeners know, I got most of the times I don't get to talk to my guests before they've been on the show. I always say this is like Forrest Gump's box of chocolates. I never know what I'm going to get, but it's always pretty tasty. But I got to talk to Craig last week, and he was in the midst of an online battle to try to buy a car through Bring a Trailer. Of course, I just had Randy Nonnenberg on the show not too long ago. So when you're in that process, and you're a smart guy, you've been around finance, you know how to manage it really well, so you're not just buying things on the whim. Uh, for those some maybe young listeners out there that are thinking of buying a first collector car or a second or third, what are some of these tips you might share that that have served you well with all the cool cars you bought? Well, the number one rule is if you're married, get your wife's permission. <laughs> That's critical, absolutely crucial yes. to the whole process. <laughs> absolutely. Let's see, have you been married for a long time, Craig? Well, my wife and I met in 1980. We got married in 1996. It doesn't, you know, that 16, that 16 year That's gap. That's a long dating period. Well, <laughs> it was a long, I asked her to marry me a couple hundred times in those 16 years. She asked me to marry her once. And <laughs> didn't, I said no, just to get even with her. And she said, I'm not taking no for an answer. I said, I wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> yeah, you should have thought of that. Oh, yeah, that's exactly. funny. Well, you're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Having your partner spouse uh, be a part of this thing is really important. I've yeah. got friends that Absolutely. have tried yeah. that and it does not work well. It doesn't end well. Yeah. Luckily, she she loves cars herself. Oh, good. Okay. And the first one, when we started thinking about it, when we started making a little bit of money and, and uh, she her passion is landscaping and gardening and mine... It, is cars. Okay. I grew up in the car business. And, you know, I finally decided, started to say, you know, 
I would, when I was in the 1950s, I was too young to drive, but I already fantasized about owning this car and owning that one and driving this one. And now that I had a little extra investment money, I wanted to go back to the 50s and buy some of those dream cars that I thought about and, and watched and saw. Um, and that was kind of my motivation is to go back and recapture some of that, what I felt as a kid. Mm-hmm. And the first car we bought was a Ford Thunderbird. My dad was a Ford dealer and it was kind of a memorial to him in his life and, and what he taught me. And I also got involved in that dealership for a while. What year was that T-Bird? Uh, 57. Oh, classic. Perfect. Yeah. We actually went to Barrett Jackson to buy, to bid on a Corvette. There was a 57 or 58, I forget which Corvette there that we saw online. And we went, that was going to be our first purchase. We got there and some of the C1 Corvettes, if they have red paint and red interior, either one of those reds sometimes comes off pretty orange yeah. uh, in comparison. And this car was dramatically in, in that way. But right next to it was a rare willow green. And my wife says, I always, I always have to say rare. Rare, rare yeah. willow green T-Bird. She goes, well, let's bid on this one instead. I love the color. So yeah. we, we're on the stage in our 30 seconds of fame. <laughs> and I, the guy that was bidding against me was two feet away from me. And I, I looked over at him because every time he gave a number, my wife elbowed me. And I said, you're going to lose because yeah. i got to keep my yeah. wife happy. And, and we overpaid a little bit for it, but we've enjoyed the car. We had a great time with it. And it reminds me of my dad. So it's all good. Yeah, well, you just touched on something very important uh, that I've learned from many, many collectors, and that is buy a car you really love. And even if you overpay a little bit, you really will never look back versus buying a car thinking it's a good investment, which is typically not the right thing to do, right? Yes. I I never consider car purchase an investment because I would never, I've never sold a collector car that I've purchased. Well, there you go. (laughs) Yeah, and I've never. I've I've restored some that were in pretty bad shape when we bought them. Put a lot of money into them more than they're worth. But I've had so much fun uh, showing those cars and driving them and and watching people. Most of my cars, as you read off a list of some of those, are unknown to a lot of people. And I love talking about cars that people have never seen before or, or ask questions. What the heck is that kind of a thing at car shows? By the end of the day, I'm I'm exhausted and, and my voice is hoarse <laughs> because some of these cars generate a lot of conversation. Typical example, we showed our 54 uh, EMW at Amelia Island a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting next to the car and this guy was strolling by with his wife. And as, as, as car guys like to do, we like to impress our wives with our knowledge and, <laughs> and you know, make them you know, ooh and all over us. And he was going through the cars um, and explaining what each one was. And, uh, and he gets to our car and it's an EMW, which uh, not too many people have heard of, but yeah. it's an East German built BMW. Okay. Uh, built in the same factory by the same people using the same tools and dies, the whole shooting mat. So it's not a replica, it's the actual car of just different management. And he came up with car car and he said, oh, this is a late 30s BMW. And he said 327, which was right. And then he looked and he saw red and white roundels on it instead of blue and white. And he looked, got a frown on his face and he said, well, I don't know who restored this, but they really screwed up the <laughs> emblem. And I'm sitting there saying, okay, I've got to defend my honor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I went up to him in a very polite way because I know his wife was standing right there. And I said, you might be interested in hearing the story about this car. And I told him what it was. And, and he walked away and he said, I've never heard of that car. You know, I love that. that was, those kind of moments are what I have these cars for. Of course, all those years of credibility he had built up with his wife just went right yeah. down the toilet with that little yeah. visit. Exactly. There is a downside to that story, yes. Yeah, a little bit. Well, I was going to ask you, my next question about buying uh, cars was going to be selling and, and some of the driving forces that bring you to that. But since you don't sell cars, you just keep them. No. Let's talk about uh, maybe one or two of the more unique vehicles on your list, because you, as I mentioned, you have nine cars and very wide variety, although there's a trend here in the 50s, I see. Uh, yeah. That's what you like. Yeah. That's the era I enjoy, too. So let's pick one or two and just touch on uh, some unique vehicles that you have in your collection. You know, if you collect stamps, you can put your collection in a drawer somewhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah. When you collect cars, it's a little bigger problem. Mm-hmm. And so I had to narrow my focus down because I, I love cars of all ages and periods and, and that kind of thing. And I, I always get excited about going to car shows. So we kind of narrowed it down to the 50s to give us some reasonable attempt at having adequate space. And I wanted convertibles just because I like driving an open top car. So that was kind of the motivation for starting the collection. And like I said, we started with 57 T-Bird. I will tell you the most recent acquisition 
uh, is the most unusual one in the group. It's a, and you mentioned it. It's a 52 Lancia Aurelia B52 Ghia B Junior. Very Beautiful. long name. Yeah. Yeah. And there's only two of them. Uh, and I know the other one is in Italy. I've been in contact with the owner of that one. He's restoring his as well. Uh, and he's been a wealth of knowledge and help in that, dealing with that car. Mm-hmm. And what I like about it, it's very 50s in look. It's very 50s in colors. And it's, it's unique. It's a hard top. It's the only hard top that we have. But I'm impressed with it's a 52 car. It's a two-door hard top, but it's very low. It doesn't, you know, it looks like a Hudson Hornet that's been chopped and channeled. Yeah. And I, I just love the 50s look. So that was kind of one that really kind of jumped out at me. Yeah, the Lancia basically is such a unique car. No one's ever seen it. Uh, it's one of two. And the other one's in Italy, like I said earlier, and it generates a ton of conversation. The other car that I think that I really like is it's a 53 Sunbeam Alpine Mark I. It was restored by the prior owner to match the car that Grace Kelly drove into Catch a Thief. Uh, yeah. Same paint interior and that kind of thing. And that car is does phenomenally at car shows. It's even one best of show, even though it's not t- your typical best of show, multi-million dollar, you know, classic car. But it's a good people car. We like people's choice kind of things. Yeah, that car was at a car show that we were walking around and we saw the car and there were no seats in it. And we looked kind of odd. And we looked about 20 feet away and the owner had taken the seats out and made big chairs out of them at Balboa Park in San Diego. Really? And they were just sitting there. Yeah. And so on the way home, my wife loved, she goes, I love that car. We should try to buy that car. And I said, well, I don't know who it was. You know, we didn't get a name or anything, but I, I'll call the, co- the show organizer. And I said, give him my contact and have him call me. And he did. And I said, my wife loves your car and we'd like to buy it if it's possibly for sale. And he goes, your timing is perfect. <laughs> I'm retiring. I'm buying a boat. We're going to sail the East Coast. I'm using the money from this car to help buy the boat. And I found out he lived two minutes from me, drove over to his house with a checkbook, wrote wow. a check for the car. And my wife has loved that car ever since. So You know, sometimes things are meant to be. Let me jump back to this yes. Lancia. Is yours yeah. the one that's blue and white? Yes. Kind yeah. of a turquoise, turquoise I've blue. I've seen yep. your car. Yes. Oh, have you? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. You had that at an event uh, on the lawn. Oh, I'm trying to remember where that was. Um, was it down during Car Week in Monterey, Pebble? Well, you've got a very good memory. This car, I've only owned this car for a few months. Oh, um, so someone else? It, bro- okay. Yeah. Yeah, it showed at Pebble in 2007, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah on Sunday. And the history of that car from there, it went to auction in Arizona. German fellow bought it Mm -hmm. in 2007, right after the, the, uh, the auctions were over or the show was over and spent from 2007 until we bought it in Europe, never got registered or licensed. So it was never used that much. Went from dealer to dealer, ended up with a dealer in Italy, and that's where I bought it from. I just, I was looking on the computer, I, like I do, sometimes I, I just see what's for sale and what's out there, and I just love the look of the car, and read a little bit about it and got pretty excited about it, so I called the Italian guy. One nice thing about the car, the car being car guys in the car business, and you, the people you meet and the network you develop, this car was in Italy, and obviously, I've few thousand miles from there but yeah. i called a friend of mine in israel and i said who's a car guy and i said do you know anybody in italy that might be able to go do a drive-by in this car and he goes absolutely i've got a guy an hour from there and he's got a full-time mechanic to take care of his collection he'll send the mechanic down to look at it for you wow called him and the mechanic went down drove and he says buy this car it's it's a beautiful car it's got a little bit of work to do but you know because uh, it hasn't been maintained properly yeah. but it's a good car to buy so that gave me some sense of security that I was doing a good thing and yeah. put it on the boat, got it here. It's got a very unique paint job and it kind of reminds me, I subscribe to Cavalino Magazine and their current issue has a Ferrari that's got a, it's a Ghia bodied Ferrari that has a very unique, similar kind of paint scheme where mm-hmm. part of the car is one color, it's a salmon color, mm-hmm. the other part's gray. It kind of, when I saw, when you were describing this, I went, I think I've seen this car before. And I think part of my memory being good here, which sometimes it isn't, is since uh, we 
we're recording your show here a week after what would have been car week. All last week, I was looking at pictures from past car events. I've been to car week for 30 years in a row. So this was, was going to be my 31st. Yeah. Really. And yeah. I was pulling up old pictures and memories and pictures of people. And that car popped up because you had mentioned it. And I knew I had seen it and taken a picture. I've got a library of over 100,000 images. So uh, oh, just- <laughs> it took me a little while because I haven't categorized them by car. There's just too much work. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, very cool. Well, we're going to take a short break and thank our sponsors. And we come back. I'm going to talk a little bit about your passion how you got into cars, even though that wasn't uh, part of your world. So sit tight, keep the seatbelt on, and we'll be right back. What do you do after running a race team for 27 years with over 100 professional wins, multiple wins at the 24-hour of Daytona, and a win at Le Mans? Well, if you're Kevin Buckler, a racer and the racing group's team owner, you create Adobe Road Winery. Located in Petaluma, California, he and his team have created a winning combination with The Racing Series, four ultra-premium red wine blends that are in a class of their own. Like racing, these wines comprise of art, precision, engineering, science, and a whole lot of fun. You can choose from four blends titled Redline, Apex, Shift, and the 24. Today I'm going to tell you about Redline. It's a rich and complex blend delivering a taste of ripe blackberries, black cherry licorice, and a hint of toasty oak. An added very cool option is that this features the world's first interactive wine label. That's right. When you pour the wine, the three-dimensional tachometer actually hits the red line. It's incredible. The Racing Series is a killer gift for the automotive enthusiast in your life, and I've got a deal for you. If you use the code CARSYEAH, all one word in all caps, when you go to checkout, you'll get $10 off any purchase of wines from the Racing Series. The wine ships promptly and arrives quickly right at your door. Use the code CARS yeah, checkoff for $10 off of your purchase today. There's always a seat at the table for excellence with the racing series. Go to adoberoadwines.com and use the code CARS yeah to save $10 today. <coughs> Cheers! Let's step away from the conversation to talk about our charity of choice here at CARS yeah, America's Automotive Trust. America's Automotive Trust is a group of like-minded nonprofits that are working together to preserve and promote car culture across the country. Together, they provide scholarships and grants to aspiring technicians and restoration artists. They provide youth education programs and bring communities together through automotive-related events, car shows, and drives. Among those nonprofits is RPM Foundation, a terrific organization working to keep our favorite collector cars on the road. RPM was created to ensure that the specialized skills needed to care for classic automobiles, boats, and motorcycles continue to be passed down from generation to generation. They do this by supporting training for young people with a passion for restoration and setting them up with mentors who can share their valuable knowledge. So far, they've awarded more than $3.5 million to restoration education projects across 35 states. Incredible. To learn more about RPM or to donate to their mission, visit www.rpm.foundation. You'll be glad you did. My favorite collector car magazine is Keith Martin's Sports Car Market. I've been a subscriber for decades. Sports Car Market is the Wall Street Journal for enthusiasts and collectors. It's your monthly must-read. Whether you dream of owning a collector car, maybe you have two, or maybe you've got 200. Sports Car Market has been around for 31 years, and it's filled with valuable articles, intelligent write-ups, and the latest auction sales. Go to sportscarmarket.com and subscribe today. Here's a couple deals I have for you just for listening here on Cars Yeah. If you use the checkout code Cars Yeah, you'll receive a 50% discount on your digital subscription at Sports Car Market. That's an exclusive offer from Cars Yeah. And guess what? Here's another deal. If you'd like to get the actual magazine, use the code BSH for buy, sell, hold. That's code BSH. And you'll get $10 off your annual print subscription. That's right. $10 $10 off. Both of these are exclusive offers here at Cars Yow for Sports Car Market Magazine. Just go to sportscarmarket.com and get your deals today. All right, we're back, Craig. You know, one thing I neglected to ask you that I asked all my guests is, 
to share a big challenge that you faced in your life and, and how you worked through that and what that taught you as a lesson that you could carry forward. Could you uh, take a, maybe, maybe a short dive into one of those situations? Well, I, I talked about it a little bit before. I, the biggest challenge I think I had was the situation involving the CPA exam mm-hmm. because I had just gotten accepted to law school. And obviously, if I got ensnared in some kind of a bad thing with the CPA exam, yeah, that whole thing would be over as well. The interesting thing about it, my dad wanted to sue people for slander and libel. Uh, he was very upset about the whole thing. And I'll I bet. said, Dad, I'm, in, I'm innocent. Let's yeah. just let the process work its way through. And it did turn out okay at the end. What was interesting was the investigator gave me a question when the first interview, I didn't even, they called me in for an interview. I had no idea why I was there. And he asked me one question and he said, would it have been easy to cheat on the exam? And I went through a discourse of how easy it would have been. And he said, I felt you were, I was 99% convinced you were innocent at that point. Cause if you had cheated, you wouldn't have told me how easy it was. Uh, there you go. <laughs> you well, know? there you go. Tell but the truth, this, right? That one. Yeah. Tell the truth. Absolutely. And like I said, I had confidence in the fact that, you know, I knew what happened and what didn't happen. And I just said, you know, when, when things go tough, sometimes calmness and serenity and confidence in who you are pays huge dividends because other people tend to overreact or, or fire back or something and make things worse. Right. Exactly. Very well said. Yeah. And the other instance, when uh, I bought into my dad's dealership and found out I was very good on the parts and service side of things, but horrible on the sales side of things, okay. which doesn't make a Define your strengths. Very happy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I, I came away, you know, from that experience, I, and I'll give you two examples of why I didn't, I wasn't a good fit. And I, I know dozens of car dealers, and they're all great guys, but it just wasn't for me. But I had one meeting with my used car guy. We weren't selling a lot of used cars, and I said, you know, we have a 30-day warranty on cars. I said, what happens uh, hypothetically if the transmission falls out of the car six months later? Are you going to help that guy? And he says, well, probably that's a major thing. And I mm-hmm. said, well, if that's the case, why don't we extend our warranty to six months? Because that's what you're doing. Mm. And he said, his response to me was, if we do that, everybody's going to want to come here and buy a car. And he was upset by that. <laughs> and I'm sitting the there idea? saying, okay, that, that <laughs> I said, okay, this is obviously we, we've got a, we've got an issue here. And my second example, a salesman came to me and he says, I just can't close the deal on this, on this guy. He thinks, you know, the price is too high and stuff. So I walked in and I sat down with him and I had the invoice with, him. and I said, what do you think a fair percentage over my cost would be? for this car. And he threw out, I think, 10% or something. And I said, okay, if I add 10% to my cost, the price will actually go up. Not down. <laughs> there you go. Because you, yeah. And he says, I don't believe that. And I turned the invoice around to him and I showed him, here's my net price. And I also showed him, I said, there, here's my advertising bill, which I get back. So my net, my net price is these two. I said, no other dealer will probably tell you that. And he turned to me and he says, that's just a fake invoice you show the public. And I'm sitting there saying, <laughs> seriously, I want to buy, I want you to buy a car from me, but I don't want to go to prison making that happen. I'm not going to give you a fraudulent. So I felt that, you know, I was a square peg in a round hole kind of thing yeah. with those two yeah. experiences. And to get past that, I've always been really good at school. And I told my dad, I said, you know, I think we need to do something else. This just isn't working for you or me. And I went back to school. My wife was still getting a PhD in psychology at Berkeley. And I went back to get an MBA just to kind of clear my mind. And and it turned out to be a a good thing. I'm going to get an MBA to clear my mind. Craig, you are one heck of a guy. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) You know, a lot of people go fishing to clear their mind or they go for a drive. But you got got an MBA. Exactly. (laughs) Wow. Impressive. It it was a good move on my part. And, you know, recharge my batteries. And I met some great, young, energetic, very enthusiastic, brilliant kids. Uh, I was 20 years older than everybody else in that class. um, And I was called grandpa, uh, which is all okay. Yeah. But it was a good move. You know, so I I came where I think what you have to do is your interest and your skill sets have to match the job you want. Yes. uh, Because if they don't, then you're just going to be spinning your wheels. You're going to be unhappy for sure. Uh, uh, Share share a little story with us that instigated this personal passion for you that you have for cars. Obviously, you love cars. So what was that pivotal moment when you knew you were going to be a car guy? Well, as I said, my dad was a car dealer. I grew up in the car business. I worked every job in a dealership you could work. So I was always around cars. And my passion probably started before I could drive. As I said, in the 50s, I always found, I read Hot Rod magazines and I loved Hot Rods, you know, all the candy paints they had back in those days and yeah. all the chrome and stuff. And so I was from, almost from birth. I think I was probably a, a DNA inherited kind of guy, car guy. And I think, you know, hanging around with the dealership after school and, and on weekends and doing that kind of stuff 
just fed a, a passion. And I, I kind of drifted away from it when I got into law later. I was just kind of Busy. living life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I was playing a little golf and doing, you know, stuff that lawyers do or whatever. And it, it kind of got to the point where I said, you know, I, I still like cars a lot, but I, all I have is the one that takes me to and from work. And my wife was working with me at the time, and she and I would bounce some stories back and forth and, and some of the cars that she owned when she was younger. And that conversation with her probably is what fueled my reinterest or reignited my interest in cars and yeah. the rest of the history from that point. Was that first special collector car indeed that T-Bird that you and your wife bought? It was. 57? Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, yep. I'm going to crawl into your head, uh, be a little bit of a uh, psychologist here. Gary Place. We'll see, see how I do. Uh, I got okay. my seatbelt on, though, so I'm, I'm safe. Okay, good, good. If you woke up tomorrow and you were a vehicle, not what you want to be, but how you perceive yourself manifest as a vehicle, what would Craig be? Uh, Craig would be a VW bus from the early 60s. Okay, uh, yeah. Probably uh, Safari windows and strength three window. I just like it's kind of a, you know, it just sign- signifies kind of a youthful period in my life, but it also signifies kind of a laid back, easy going yeah. lifestyle. You know, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm driven. I can be highly focused when I want to be, but that's not a constant condition. And I think a VW bus probably symbolizes, and I mentioned that to my wife a few days ago, because yeah. uh, I saw that, I knew that question was coming and she totally agreed. Oh, so, okay. Well, that's yeah. very cool. I, well thought. You know, it's interesting to me knowing you now, and as we've talked a few times, I, I would think you're so much more high power. You've been so successful and driven and everything. But, you know, it's good to balance that life, <laughs> life yin yang thing a little bit. So, uh, yeah, 60s bus. I love it. Well, we're going to enter into the last lap, kind of a lightning round. I'm going to ask for some real quick answers to these questions, but I'm going to fire them off. Would you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes in life? Uh, yeah, I just mentioned it. Actually, uh, I have an extraordinary ability to focus. When I have a task at hand, uh, World War III could be going on around me, uh, <laughs> and it doesn't bother me that much or all. I don't even notice it. I have, when I have something important that I want to get done or learn about or enhance my skill sets or whatever, I can bring 110% to that pretty easily. What's one of the, uh, I'm going to expand on that a little bit that might help people. What's one little trick you might offer to somebody who has a hard time focusing? Well, that's a good question. I think, number one, if you're going to focus on something, I think it has to be something you find of interest. Mm. Otherwise, you're swimming upstream. And I think sometimes that's a signal. If you're if you're having trouble focusing, it may be something that you're chasing that you shouldn't be chasing in the first place. There you go. You know, because it, it, seems, it seems to me, and it doesn't have to be work-related, it, you know, any, a task around the house or whatever. If you have an interest in it and enjoy it and want to get better at it, that kind of thing, I think the focus comes much more easily than it does if you're coming doing something that, you know, like if someone said, you want to learn how to pull teeth, I'm not sure I could focus on that. <laughs> How'd you know I I'm going would... to the dentist tomorrow? Oh. <laughs> yeah. well, luckily, they're yeah. not pulling any teeth, so that's a good thing. Yeah. How about if exactly. I could arrange for you to have a drink or a meal with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would it be? My dad. Your dad. Yeah, me too. Yeah. How about the uh, best automotive advice someone else has ever offered you? What would that be? Gosh, that's a good question. I would think, well, you know, interesting you say, you know, don't buy things on a whim. I can't honestly say I've done, I followed that <laughs> you rule. You followed that, yeah. Because I, I'll tell you a story that's a classic example. The Singer, 52 Singer 4AD. Again, I was looking at the computer and I had a picture of that car. I, I, at that point, I'd never even heard of the Singer brand. I had no idea what it was. And I was just reading about it with the picture on the computer. My wife walked through my office and she goes, oh, it's Singer 4AD. And I turned around <laughs> and said, how in the hell did you know that? Yeah. And she goes, when I was eight years old, my older brother had a friend whose father owned one of those cars and she oh. and her sister dressed as witches in a Halloween parade yeah. and got to ride in the back seat in that car. And she no remembered kidding. it like it was yesterday. And that little story prompted me. I said, well, I'm buying this car. It was yeah. for sale for like $3,000 or something like that. And I said, I'm going to buy it in your honor and we'll fix it up. And you can remember being a, a witch in the back seat. <laughs> uh, so sometimes a whim does strike me, you know, same thing with a Lancia. My wife only three times out of the nine cars, she's, said, go ahead and buy it. One was the T-Bird. She loved it. Then one was the Singer. And the third time when she came through the office, she saw the picture of the Lancia on my screen and she goes, buy it. She didn't even know what it was, wow. but she loved the car. And I said, enough said. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm on it. You married the right gal. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Matter of fact, you know, I think that anybody that wants to be a happy car collector has to have a woman who loves cars. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, the sing it's an interesting car to me because my dad had a 49 MGTC. And to me, the Singer looks like, mm-hmm. it looks like an MGT series, but kind of almost, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but like a little clown car. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's squished yep. in and puffed out a little bit. And there's, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a great, I, when I was looking this car up last night and I knew we were going to talk today, there's some great photos taken of uh, Sammy Davis Jr. and Marilyn Monroe with a Singer. Have you seen those yes. pictures? I've got them. You yeah. got yeah. I've, I've, yeah. I've got a big, thick steering binder. The one, my favorite one is a Singer 4AD with Marilyn Monroe laying across the hood. Yep. And I said, if you look at the car really carefully, you'll see that the front fender is bending up into a smile. <laughs> you mean there's a car <laughs> in that Marilyn picture? Monroe's. I didn't know there was a car in that picture. Oh, yeah, I guess there is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess there exactly is. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a great shot of Sammy Davis Jr. kind of flying into the shot almost. With yeah, her, and yeah. there's another one, uh, the dancer, Dennis O'Connor, I think is his name. There's a picture okay. with him. There's quite a few stars that that, that car got photographed with. Yeah, very cool. Uh, is there a great resource out there when it comes to collecting cars that you really love? Absolutely. First thing I do when I buy a car is I look for car clubs of that mark yeah. and join them because there's guys in there that have owned some of these cars from new, that know all the foibles about them, where to get parts the history of the cars, you know, some interesting stories about the manufacturer, that kind of thing. I find car clubs amazing. Yes. At one point, I belonged to 18 different car clubs, oh my gosh. Uh, both here in the, in the States and in, in the UK, and I found all of those associations to be tremendous assets uh, in developing yes. a richer sense of the car yeah. and also, you know, in restoring them and getting authentic parts and that kind of thing. Car clubs are tremendous. Yeah, incredible resource. How about a book? Is there a book you might share with our listeners you think they should read? Well, you know, I think that when it comes to car books, one of my favorites, uh, Bert Levy wrote one, uh, uh-huh. The Last Open Road. Yeah. And I love that book. It's, you know, it's based on actual fact, but it's got sense of humor and yeah. it's, a, it's an easy book to read. And I just like his, his a take on things. I remember him talking about a race, I think it was in Wisconsin at, at Road America, I think. Mm-hmm. Where uh, Phil Hill, the young kid, he didn't mention him too much. He just said a young kid from California was racing against the Cunningham team in an XK120. And the Cunningham team had come back from uh, Europe uh, racing in Le Mans, I think. And, it just, you know, the richness of the fabric that he takes actual happenings and puts it into this story with the sense of humor. I love that book. Bert's been a guest several times on my show. He's become a friend. I've known him for a long time. And he mm-hmm. took that last open road book and last year and he made a 50s style radio show audio book out of it with all these different guests, many of them being famous, one of them being me, actually. He asked me to do really? a little little cameo in that, and I'll, I'll put a link to that. Uh, it's a really fun listen. It's done with sounds and voices. And I would has, love that. Oh, it's, yeah. just, it's just marvelous. So, uh, yeah, listeners, yep. check that out. Uh, get that. It's just hilarious. Bert is an incredible guy, and he has a whole series of six, seven, or eight books now. I've got the whole set. I, I met him at Amelia a couple of years ago. Oh, we good. were back there showing, showing that he was at his books there. I bought the whole thing. He's a character for sure. All right. We're yes. up to the checkered flag here, Craig. This could be a very difficult question for you. I'm going to buy you any cool collector car on the planet, but here's the deal. You can only have one collector car. That means all your cars have to go away. Uh, now, if you have one in your collection that would be the the keeper that ticks all the boxes, that would be the way you'd answer this. But if there's another car out there you've really uh, lusted after, I'm going to buy it for you today. Um, you can't sell it to buy back all your cars with. So that little uh, economic trick is off the table because I know you're a smart guy when it comes <laughs> to economy and finances. Mm. So what would that one car be that ticks all the boxes for you? Ferrari 250 GT short wheelers. Ah, okay. I have I have expensive taste way beyond my ability. Yeah, we all do. Um, most of us yeah. do. Well, it's a it's a marvelous car. In fact, uh, just recently I had, uh, and she's going to come back on the show, I had Cece Muldoon, who's a Ferrari expert from Europe, uh, UK, on the show. And she talked about her dad having one of those when she was a little girl. She actually spent a, sent me a great picture of her sitting on the fender when she was probably, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old. Yeah. Wonderful car. It does it all, right? I mean, it's street yeah. track. I mean, it's everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, I love the, the lines. I love the, the, the history of it. And, you know, it's just a magnificently done car. Yeah, they're beautiful. What color would you like yours to be? Has to be red and tan. Red, rosso. Okay, yeah. there you go. Yep. All right. Yep. Well, I'll get to work. I knew a few people that have those. They're, they're going to command a big price, though, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> 
That's okay. <laughs> yeah. I, once you get in the eight figures, your you're several figures past my limit. <laughs> yeah, me too. Absolutely. <laughs> Craig, you've taken me on an awesome ride today. This has been fun, and I uh, can't wait to get in my car and come over there and visit you. Um, my son is in, My son's in town. Maybe I should bring him over. We can come over and Absolutely. see some of your cars. That sounds like fun. Before I let you go, though, could you offer me a little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you rip off into the, uh, let's say, the uh, mountains around here in the Pacific Northwest in that beautiful 250 SWB? Well, I think the best thing you can do is to share your passion with others yeah. because it makes it a richer, more a deeper experience for yourself. Yeah. And, I, you know, the neighbors come over here and look at the garages all the time and uh, they usually bring little kids with them. I, I love sharing yeah. with people. Yeah. Absolutely love sharing with it. It's the way to do it, especially with children, to kind of spark that interest for the yeah. future caregivers and caretakers of these vehicles we have. I know that you're pretty kind of semi-retired, retired a little bit, so you're not a big uh, player in the social media world. So uh, am I right to say we'll kind of just leave your privacy where it's at and hopefully somebody will meet you on a Concours lawn when you have a car on display? Is that about right? That'll be it. That'll yep, be it. Absolutely. absolutely. Always, always open to discussion. There we go. There we go. Well, listeners, yep. thanks for listening today. And Craig, thank you for being so generous with your time and expertise and sharing your experiences with the Cars yeah audience. Until you and I talk again, which I think is going to be pretty soon in person here, I'll see you yeah. down the road. Look forward to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey, listeners. I had a really, really cool time talking with Craig. By the way... A few days after that, I got to go over to his house and he spent, gosh, the whole morning with me showing me his collection of cars. Absolutely fabulous. Pretty rare when I have a guest on the show and I get to go meet him and play with his cars the next few days. So thank you, Craig, for sharing your cars. And I noticed while I was over there that Craig's a retired Marine. So hoorah. Thank you for your service to this great country. Car people, they really are the best. If you're listening to Cars Yeah, you've probably spent some time working on your favorite ride. But how confident are you working on your finances? You may be able to rebuild a fuel injection system, but can you decipher the details of a mutual fund? If you're like me, investments, insurance, annuities, budgeting, and other financial concepts may seem a bit daunting. But what if I told you there's a book that describes these subjects and more in an easy to read and a very humorous way? My friend Chris Kimball, CFP, a longtime sponsor and past guest here on Cars yeah, has written that book and it's titled The Saga of Ike and Penny, a couple's humorous journey through the confusing world of finance. It's a fun look at things you need to know. Everything from investing to effective ways to get rid of credit card debt and it's probably the only book on finance with a VMAX on the front cover and a classic Mini Cooper on the back. The book's available at Amazon for just $10 and this book will dramatically improve the direction of your financial future. I gave copies to each of my children. All securities are through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Christopher Kimball Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Get your copy, The Saga of Ike and Penny, today. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah! Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah! Yeah!